So any questions from all our discussions today? Emptiness, the mind, all these things. Any questions? Hmm? Nothing at all? Yes. Nothing? No questions? Nothing you want to talk about? Nothing? So I've got to think of more things to say. Do my job. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I didn't talk about it. that's right. Well, no, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say about the Pure Land. Or the more we understand, okay, the more we understand emptiness, that everything is created by the mind, the more we understand that things don't have an intrinsic nature, the more we understand that the universe, that mind is not physical and it's beginningless and endless, and the more we understand that the universe is made of the four elements, and the more we understand that negative states of mind create terrible karmic appearances, and we can we know that. Even in one day, if you're miserable, the world looks revolting. Look at a person who's paranoid. They're literally seeing demons come out of people's ears. Who do you think creates that? It's the deluded mind, you know? So if you can imagine, then it doesn't make too much, there's not too much of a stretch of imagination. If we think the mind is beginningless and endless, if we think it's, un, if it, if we think it's uh, not physical, if we see the, element, the, the universe is made of the four elements, if all minds are conjoined with the four elements, then we can, and then we think about karma, all those bits and pieces, all the bits of the puzzle in this world view, then it makes sense that we can understand that some states of being are utterly blissful with blissful karmic appearances and some states of being are like hell, literally, with terrible karmic appearances because the minds make everything up. But our dualistic view, certainly the materialist view, which is the absolute view of fundamentalism, that what, what we see is what exists. That's it, you know. The mind is the brain and what's in front of you is what exists. So the more we understand the other view, then the idea of there being a, an enlightened being manifesting in a subtle light form that subtle beings in their meditation can cognize kind of makes sense. And then because we all live in environments, it's logical. We don't just walk around in the sky. Our mind impacts upon external elements and causes them to function, to appear, to manifest, to, to function in a certain way. So deluded, deluded minds cause the elements to, 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 to you know, be harmful to us and, and virtuous minds cause the elements to be, to be beneficial to us. This is how it works, you know. So if we can think that, then we can imagine a Buddha, what a pure land is, a state of being. You don't get an aeroplane there, you know. It's not like that. It's just our world. I mean, this is not easy to think about because we've got such different views, fundamentally, utterly, completely different views, you know. So other than that, I don't know what to say. Do you, unless you have a more, another question, particular question. Ask me more question. Say it in the way you want to ask it. Not just say, tell me more about Pure Lands. Say what you mean. Who is it? Who said it? So ask a bit more, Nikki. What do you want to know? Say some, so express your question in a certain way, then I can see if I can answer it in a certain way. Did you answer it? I did. Oh, good. Okay. Very good then. Anyone else? Yes. Could you talk a bit about the Bodhisattva Vams? You mean go through them? This takes too long. No time. And it's not, it's no time. I talked about them generally. And those who want to take them seriously, I've suggested it, that people have asked me seriously. So we'll talk about it, I'd say, for, for um, it can be for everybody. We'll have a little talk in Kathmandu, I'd say. We can do it there. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. The, the, the point about the Bodhisattva, the main thing is to understand the idea of the Bodhisattva vows. They're more, the first level of vows are protect you from being negative, can protect you. There's no wiggle room. You just be, you know, just discipline your body and speech. That's it. Bodhisattva vows are more, they're all about behavior, but they're more about how to be of most benefit to others and putting yourself second and others first. That's the general idea about them. Do you understand? Yeah, Chuck. Thank you. Uh, can we go back, go back to uh, the eight verses uh, about transformation? Yes. And specifically verse five, which I think we all saw in, uh, in action, um, you know, saw an example of today. But Where was that? What was that? To, to the, well, earlier, you know, um, acknowledging the other person is right. Where? When did that happen? Well, we, 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 we saw that here. Where? You know, different, different people uh, acknowledging other people's rights. But that's not my question. My question is, how do we set boundaries? Um, and specifically, this came up in our discussion group the other day. Um, if you're supervising somebody and they're making an accusation against you that could cause you to lose your job 
or something like that, you can you know. Um, you okay. Have to be able it was, to okay, I understand, Chuck. Okay. You see, what we do is we hear these things in isolation, and then we think of 57 varieties of, we think of 57 different scenarios, and it just doesn't seem to work. It, a different, you know, when you're on the tennis court, sometimes you do a backhand, sometimes you do a forehand. You do different tools at different times according to your capacity, according to the level of your practice, according to what you know is the right thing to do. So you have, it's contextual. So if you're a supervisor, if you're, like if I said, if you're a parent and your child is abusing you, I do not think you would take the blame. Good Lord in heaven. If you're a supervisor and there's something other things going on, I mean, you've got to use your common sense. You've got to use the common sense and know at each time what is the best tool for you to use for your development for your job, it, everything's, con everything's contingent, you know? You've got to have wisdom to know what is the right thing to do at different times. Do you understand my point? Thank you. That's really important. So we're looking at each of these things that we talk about are very specific, precise instructions. And we learn them, and then in, and depending on the time, the place, the person, there's so many different you know, scenarios. You and all we're trying to do... huh? Well, that would be just plain foolish, wouldn't it? It's too, like, you know, you keep learning backhands, you just keep doing backhands for eternity. You're completely dumb. You understand? I got it. Thank you. Then you've got to know the purpose of each of the techniques. The wisdom wing techniques are to protect you from doing negative things. They're all about you. They're not about helping others. The compassion wing is all about helping others. And it's you being brave and doing, and, and doing everything. The real one about the body suffering and all these techniques is to do everything you can to smash your ego grasping. That's the bottom line for the body suffering path. Whatever smashes your ego grasping, and that might include taking the blame and getting sacked because it's the right thing to do at that time. <coughs> do you understand? Okay. I mean, every one of us, if we had the scenario that Harry had with those four Sherpas, everybody would respond differently according to our needs. Harry, you know, people have said to me when I've told that story, well, why didn't he move out of the way? Why didn't he tell them to stop? We say all these things. That's not the point. At that moment in time, at that instant, he made the decision based on his wisdom and on his own level of practice, I'll stand to the side. If they knock me, I won't hold on. You understand? 99% of us wouldn't be capable of doing that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. What else, people? We could, um, yeah, we, we, we sort of, we did finish the last two verses of the eight verses. The seventh one was at Tong Len, and we talked about that, and the eighth one is emptiness, and we're talking about that. So they're done, sort of thing. What else, people? Ask me some questions, please. Huh? Nothing? Nothing? So did we do that little exercise about me holding the cup in my right hand? No. We did. I don't remember the no. No. We didn't. No. I'm sure we did. You've just been talking about the cup. And the last time, the last time we talked about emptiness. Precisely, we did it. We did the whole scenario. So obviously everyone says no, so I'll do it again because you've all forgotten it. <laughs> okay, so we'll do that one. We'll do that one. It's a particular one I was thinking about. It's, an, it's a different approach. It's like a, taking it, t attacking it from another point of view to try to show to us how we don't need this thing that we think is in there that runs the show called I. That's the real point about this. So let's just do it a bit more leisurely, a bit more slowly to try to get the point, okay? We all just get a sense that, without analysis, we all get a feeling that there's an I in there. We say, I have this, and we, merely, we really mean, oh, I have this. We, we, we think about that. We feel it, don't we? There is an I there. We think of it, don't we? Naturally. Do we all feel that? But we've never analysed it, have we? We've never analysed it. We've never tried to pinpoint it. We just assume it. Would we agree with that, everybody? Right. So we're trying to get here. This is, this is just this approach and from another point of view. So, and it's using, again, it's using this kind of logic, you know? Well, it's trying to use logic. So, okay. There's an action called, I'm holding a cup in my right hand. 
So let's say, I mean, I use this, I said the scenario, let's say I've, I've had a stroke and I've forgotten how to do it. We know now because we're trained, our hand is trained, every bit of our body is trained, our mind is trained, and we'll pick it up and within a millisecond we do the action. And there's no, there's, because we've trained ourselves to perfection to do it properly, haven't we? Now let's, let's just do, let's break down, let's do an analysis of the components. This is just like if you ha you look at a, you know if you have to build a building you've got to make a plan and you've got to come up with thousands of components and you've got to be very accurate otherwise the building won't stand up we get that so here we, it's the same thing we're talking about an event and we've got to look at the components of that event so now I only use the example of I've got a stroke because you're going to have to train me to do it and that means you've got to have a long list of things let's say you, you'd put you'd write down a long list of the parts of my body involved in that. You need to do that, wouldn't you? So I could learn each piece again. That would be very, that's very accurate, isn't it? So I'd have to learn what the, th the finger does, what the thumb does, what the ligaments do. I have to slowly move the parts of my body, or whatever you think about. And there'd be hundreds of components. Would we agree with that? Hundreds of components. And you could have a definitive list. In the end, you could have a definitive list of all the pieces of my body involved in that action, holding a cup in my right hand. Do we agree with that? And that would be quite a long list, do we accept? And you could have a definitive list. You'd really have to in the end. If you wanted to pass an exam in anatomy, you'd have to, put it that way, you'd have to write down every little tiny piece until there's nothing left. Do we accept that? Now, the main player, clearly, is the mind. I mean, if this is a dead body, why bother, you know? So the mind is the main player. So then we look at all the parts of our mind that would be involved in that action. So the first one would be intention. And that's every second. Intend to do it. Intend to listen to you. Intend to put my thumb there. Intend to put my finger there. The intention is fundamental. Then you've got, I've got to pay attention, attention. I've got to concentrate, concentration. I've got to have many of those parts of my, the mechanics mainly. There's, not, there's no virtue or non-virtue involved in this action, I'd say. It's mostly the mechanics of my mind. Do you understand? There's no love, kindness, you know, maybe attachment to prove to you that I'm a nice girl. But forget those parts, but we could analyze those parts, but the direct parts involved in the job. So there's all those parts of my mind. Then you've got my eye consciousness, so I can see what I'm doing. I've got my ear consciousness. So you've got quite a few parts of my mind. Do we agree with this? It's a very technical list of components of Rabina that are involved in the action called holding a cup in my right hand. Are we communicating here? We, we, we get the point, right? Now, this is the point. Now, the question is, the question is, what role in holding the cup in my right hand is left over that isn't being done for the poor little me being left out? I want a job, me, me, me. What role would I do that the fingers and the toenail, the fingers and the ligaments and the joints and the, and the thumbs and the intention and the attention and the concentration aren't doing? Do you get the question? Can you hear the question? Well then, what's some suggestions, please? What suggestions, please? What's left? What job's left over? Oh, a sense of um, completion. Or a sense of um, accomplishment. That's mind. That's mind. So we've covered mind. See, we're trying to. That's the point. We're trying to find something that isn't body and isn't mind. That's the point. And it, this is the point too. If you say your eye is your mind, it's another part of your mind. Well, what job does it do? What's its job, please? This is the kind of the point. Any suggestions? Where does intention, come intention from? is the mind. Yes. That's the mind. Mm -hmm. So we've covered the mind. Body and mind is what we've got. If we want, to, this is the point the Buddha is making at the simple level of parts. There are two parts of this body. They're called body and they're called mind. Two parts of the person. Rabina is the name of this person, and there are two kinds of parts. There are mental parts, there are mind parts, and body parts. That's it. But we think there's a third part called I. Good question. If the mind is I, that means they're exactly the same thing. Would you agree? Yes. Then why would you say I have a mind? Uh, uh, See? <laughs> right there. Exactly. Yeah. Say one more time. It, okay. If there's an I, Buddha says, it's either oneness with the body and the mind, or it's separate from. So we've done the analysis separate from. But if it's oneness with, which is your suggestion, and it's a good suggestion, if, why isn't my mind my eye, then that means that only be, the, the, the mind and the eye would be literally synonymous. They wouldn't be independent of each other. That means they'd be one. So why would you say, I have a mind? 
You wouldn't say it because they're the same thing. You'd say, I have an eye. Well, that's, I mean, that could just be a figure of speech. But it's, it is a figure of speech, but that's the point. It would be only one thing, so you, you know, but you wouldn't say it. You wouldn't say it. If it's the same thing, you would not say that. If it's literally the mind is equivalent to the, mind, to the eye, if they are equivalent, mm. then we don't, have, we don't have this discussion that we're having here. And if the mind, and then the way, I mean, the analysis they say, which always sounds so silly to us, because we've got thousands of parts. The, the person called Christine is made up of thousands of bits, she, isn't she? Yes. Do you agree? And those bits, in the, this is the whole point about being, this is analysis, they call it being one or many. And if there's, if there's so if, there are, if you say, I have a nose and a hand, then we, that's, three, that's three nouns, one pronoun and two nouns. So we have to point them out. It's very simple. We have to point them out. So if you say my mind is my eye and they are literally equivalent, like saying a mug, a mug and then saying the name in French. Yeah, I think I'm saying it. Huh? You hear it? So that's the, the, but that's the, they're the two general feelings we have. Either we feel, well, it's just all of me, you know, vague feeling, it's all of me. Or we say there's a separate piece that own, the owner one. And that's the type of analysis in meditation, first logically, and then in meditation we need to do to really get the insight into this. Because it's so instinctive, this, this belief we have, you know. So it's, this is the whole interesting point. So you see, if you do want to find a boss, the boss is intention, which is your mind. The boss is intention. If you want a boss. But we think that we want to have more. That's why this, this analysis of what the job would, all the bits do their job, but, but usually the answer is, it is the one that oversees everything. It is like the creator. And that's exactly the same philosophical view of the world, of the, the, the Christian view that there is a creator who runs everything. So we believe there's an I who runs everything. It's the same philosophy. It's the dualistic view of this idea of a boss somehow, a, you know, the creator idea. And this is what the Buddha is saying we don't need. We don't need one. We don't, not a, there isn't one, but we don't need one because all the bits do fine on their own. And the same way in the universe, all sentient beings who are the components of the universe do fine creating their own happiness and suffering. They don't need punishment and reward. So it's this non-dualistic idea, you know. But uh, see, the thing is our language. That's why when you insult me, I get really, I feel really upset. And we believe. It's an eye there, Cause it, and that's why that argument about if you insult my nose, it's a very good one to think about that. If you insult my nose, if there is a separate eye, if it is a separate eye, not dependent, if it's separate, it wouldn't mind. The eye wouldn't mind, which sounds, of course, absurd to us. So this is the type of thinking, it's very interesting thinking we have to do, you know. So then, of course, the, the discussion here is when we say, I have parts, I have a nose. And then we discover among those parts, there's no eye, but there is a nose. We go, well, at least we've got a nose. But no, because what, what we're doing here is we're taking the phenomenon called I and we're doing the analysis of the parts of I. And the parts of I happen to be noses and feet and pee pee and caca. So then we say, well, what about the nose and the pee pee and the caca? Because it sounds like they exist. But no, when you start analysing the nose. So I, in the end, we discover that I is merely a name we give to the parts. Well, then we go, oh, phew, I've got a few parts then. No, nose is a name we give to its parts. And then the, lobe, the ear lobe is the, no, the name of the, the nostril is the name we give to its parts. Everything you posit, you say a word. It is a conventional truth that there is a nostril, there is a nose, there is a person, there is a rabina, there is a universe. You say that, you posit that conventionally, and that thing is made of parts. So each thing, and then you analyze the piece that's called the nose, or maybe there's a nose. No, that's only a label that's given to its parts. And then the, low, then the, the, the nostril, that's a name given to its parts. And then the, 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 the thing up the top there that's up the this, that's a name given. And everything you point to, down to the atoms, you will never find anything that's pointable, findable, distinct, um, existing from its own side. Everything's merely labeled, whatever you point to. But nevertheless, the nostril functions fine to bring in air and blow snot, etc., etc. And that's where you put these two truths together, which seems kind of difficult. You know, on the one side you can't find the eye, on the other side it still functions. The one side you say that you can't find the cup in the cup, but nevertheless it holds your tea. It's to put together these seeming contradictions, and it's like a bit like wordplay sometimes. But the one to really think about more. 
The parts, there's the parts of that one, that's the interesting, the parts one. But that's not the subtlest mistake. The subtlest mistake is th thinking that there's something out, in terms of the world, let's say outside there, forget the self, but the people out there, the world out there, the cups and toilets and prisons and, and roads and, and exist out there. And I'm this innocent onlooker. That's how things appear to us, isn't it? That's the way delusions work. That cake on that plate really looks like it's on the plate begging me to eat it. What can I do? Poor me. It's not my fault. It's the cake's fault. That's how we think of the world. The world out there is separate from me, separate from me, existing intrinsically, existing in its nature, existing inherently, existing independently of me. Buddha says it's not possible. The example of that A, the example of the five dollars is a perfect one. It's <laughs> obvious to us that until you learn the meaning of five dollars, there is no five dollars there. That's what it means. There is a five dollar note there, but th for me, there's no five dollars there because I don't know what it means. So that's the meaning about if it's in, uh, there's a five dollar note there. You know perfectly well what it is. You've learned it. And it's got a piece of paper with five in the corner and you can go and spend it. But because, until I know that, until I know that meaning, until I buy into that meaning, there, this is all it means. There is no five dollars there. That's what it means. We get that. Of course, there's a five dollar note there. You know it, but I don't. Like, you know, the Tibetan word, just a, a few squiggles. I just see squiggles. I don't see meaning. So for Tibetans, there's a meaning. They know it. But for me, there's no word there. There's just squiggles. This is clear. This is merely labelled. We call it that. We give it meaning. Everything in the universe exists like that. And the point is, if the five dollars did exist in the paper, if it were intrinsic, inherent, meaning independent of my mind calling it that, then it would be, I would know already it was five dollars. It would say, hello, I'm five dollars. No, it doesn't work like that. We can, I think we can understand this. So everything, every event, every action is, in, is dependent on arising. I am walking up the hill is a series of words, each of which has meaning, and you put them together and the whole action has meaning. But it doesn't have meaning if I don't know the meaning. I have to buy into that meaning and that's me labeling it that, and then it becomes that. For that woman in prison, I decided I am not a prisoner. I am a monk. I am not in a cell. I'm in a cave. Now, conventionally, that's called, you know, Florida prison, let's say. It didn't say on the front, monastery. So conventionally, everybody would call it a prison, and it did function as a prison for everybody else. But she made a decision to transform problems into happiness. She didn't call it that, but that's what she did. And she made a decision to relabel it. She relabeled it a, a monastery. She relabeled it her hermitage. This book I'm ed editing of Rimache is all these letters to prisoners, you know, the last 20 years. Sometimes he spends weeks. One prisoner got a letter, a 45 page type letter. The unbelievable teachings on emptiness, unbelievable teachings on, on, on attachment, unbelievable. And this is what he's talking about the whole time, about emptiness and the, the advice he's giving to these prisoners, which is against the world's view, how it's their hermitage. He said the Tibetan, you know, the Tibetans living in little holes in the wall, holes in the mountains. I mean, look at you know, Lama Zopa's cave. In the winter, no heater. For him, he was in bliss because he labelled it differently. Us, we, I mean, it's putting me in prison to live down there, you know, because my mind sees it differently. So we can still conventionally call it Laudo Cave. We can still conventionally call it Florida Prison. But she decided to see it differently. And that's the advice he gives to these prisoners. Some of them are amazing. They take it, you know, they're so serious. So it still is conventionally a prison. It, the world knows that it's known as Florida Prison. It's got high walls. You can't escape. You're sent when you're naughty. That's a fact. It's conventionally that. And this is the point the Buddha's making. We, things do exist conventionally, but we, over, we, we give it this extra status. We give it this inherence, we give it sort of concreteness, meaning it is that, so I have got no choice but to be miserable. And this woman was able to change the way she saw it. So the only point of this, the only reason to do that is because she became happy, she became content, she became fulfilled. My friends in prison who take this advice, my friend Mitch on death row getting close to his death date, he's a funny, happy guy. We spend the whole hour together in the chapel laughing hysterically. 
even about how they're going to put the, you know, how he's going to be killed. Because his mind's happy. He's come to terms with his reality, his life. Because his mind sees it differently. That's the meaning of emptiness. And in a way, that's kind of easy. We get it. We understand. We do it all the time, every day. If something, this is the point the Buddha is making, if something did exist intrinsically as that, no matter how you see it, it would never change. We know that's true. One person seeing chocolate cake gets pleasure, another person will die. There's proving emptiness right there. There's no, in, there's no intrinsic chocolate cake. This is the merely labeled one, which is the most advanced, is the real meaning to get for emptiness. But when it comes to I, it's much harder to see that, you know. The parts one for I is easier, an, an easier argument. And what we don't realize, our mind is riddled with these layers of conceptions, this concrete picture of I. So the really good approach in the day, you know, throughout the day, for the, in terms of, we've got the different, there's different techniques. If you want to watch your mind about anger, you check that out. If you want to watch the attachment, check that out. If you want to watch grasping at permanence, check that one. If you want to watch looking at grasping at the eye, then that's another one. They're all different techniques. Depends which one you have to practice, you know. So the really excellent way to practice applying emptiness in daily life, as His Holiness said, so simple, so sweet. See something from another point of view. That's all the woman in prison did. That's what she did. She just saw it from another point of view. It's a, I'm, not a, I'm, not a pro, I'm, not, I'm not a prisoner, I'm a monk. Boom, she changed. Right there. That's applying emptiness. Right there. See it from another point of view. And that's what a fundamentalist mind is. A mind that's got a lot of ego grasping. A person who's very ego grasping. Powerful sense of I. Like a rock of Gibraltar. They're fundamentalist. There's not a millimeter of space to ever see anything other than the way they see it. That's concrete mind. That's mind grasping really strongly at things as inherent. So to see it from another point of view, that's applying emptiness. That's amazing. Because it's a dependent arising. Things exist in dependence upon this and that. That's why when we start to analyze, you know, when, we, when we looked at, when we broke down into four component parts, the, an action, in, in order to discover whether you create negative karma or positive karma, that's proving emptiness. So in general, conventionally, killing is, la is labeled a negative action. That's, its valid, that's a valid definition, let's say, because a person suffers. That's what Buddha would define as a negative action, because it causes suffering. So we can accept validly, like a cup is the thing that holds your tea. That's a valid cognition. And then we can say, you know, an, a, a negative action of killing is an action of killing that mouse in your kitchen, in general, is a negative action. But in order, in order to discover whether when you do it, you create a negative or positive action, that depends not on the fact that you killed the mouse. It depends on these other conditions, in particular, what your mind is seeing. In the same way that that woman in prison, she, she, she didn't change the fence or the barbed wire or her sentence or everybody else's view. She was a, a cop killer in a prison supposed to be on death row. She just changed one component. It's a dependent arising made up of all those bits and pieces. You know, that woman in prison is made of all these bits and pieces, like an event, you know, like my holding a cup in my right hand. You, you, you identify the components. It's, it's, got, it's dependent on parts in this case. So what she did was take out one part called this is prison and she put another part in. She swapped the brick for that edifice and she called it, it's a, you know, it, I'm in a cell. Uh, so I'm in a cave. And she changed another part called, I'm not a prisoner, I'm a monk. So the whole thing took on a new picture. She painted a new picture. So she beca it became something different. For her, it was something different. That proves emptiness. So the action of killing a mouse is the same. So, you know, if um, Christina kills the mouse, believing that she's helping the mouse because the poor mouse is so suffering, and she really means well. She's really compassionate. And she kills the mouse. One dead mouse. If I kill a mouse full of anger, another dead mouse. The mouse from the mouse's side, they don't care. They're dead. But each action we did is a different action, and that proves emptiness. It's a dependent arising. The one component in hers was compassion. The one component in my, the rest of it was the same. There was a mouse, there was intention, she did the action, the mouse died. For me, the same. One piece, 
Two B was my motivation. My motivation was to hurt the mouse. How dare the mouse be in my kitchen? Her motivation was to help the mouse. That covered, that gave the whole action a different flavor. My action was completely colored by the one component called the, the, the motivation, the anger. So that's proving emptiness. So d negative actions are also empty of ex existing from their own side. Everything is empty of existing from its own side. But when we understand that means it's a conventional truth, then we know it, it functions to hurt the mouse. The mouse still got hurt. That doesn't ever change. But depending on our motivation. So that woman's changed her view of prison. Therefore, and it, now that's the point. If it were inherently existent, which is what ego grasping thinks, but we don't think we think that. We don't, we don't think like this. We don't think we have a thing called ego grasping, and we don't think we cling at things as, as concrete. So what, if it did exist the way we think it does, which is, ego, which is intrinsic as that from its own side, then we would never be able to be happy. You could never call it anything else. It will be set in stone. And Buddha's simple point is that nothing in the universe, nothing, nothing in the universe can possibly exist like that, which is why the Prasangika view is there cannot possibly be an in, any even a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a millimeter of an eye there. There can't be. There just can't be. Nothing can exist like that. Everything is dependent on causes, on parts, on mind labeling, and in fact many other things. But there are three crucial ones we're discussing here to attack three different philosophies in our mind that we don't know we have because they're so deep. So reality, Buddha says, reality, reality is everything lacks that type of existence. And when we've realized that, we'll realize the conventional reality, which is that they're all merely labeled. They say once you realize emptiness, you then realize subtle dependent arising, merely labeled. Which is the conventional truth. That's what His Holiness said. The, main, the reason, you know, there's not an eye because you can't find one. There isn't an eye and you can't find one, but that's not the main premise. The main premise, His Holiness said, is that things are empty. Things aren't empty because you can't find an eye. That's true, but it's not the main premise. Things are empty because they're dependent on risings. That's what they call subtle dependent on rising, and that's the final realization. The simple example we used, you know, when, when who was it? Who was it? Ava? Or was it my, Berit? Seeing something was blue and pink. It was you, wasn't it? So let's say Berit thinks, what did I say? Well, I forget the example, but she sees pink on the blue cup. It's a mistake. She's got a misconception. But we fix her eyes. And because the expectation for so long has been to see pink, she gets the shock of her life because now she sees the truth is now revealed to her. But she doesn't first see the real truth, which is blue. The truth is blue. The conventional truth is blue. It appears to her now, her eyes are working. It appears to her, but she gets such a shock. All she sees first is the absence of pink, which is emptiness. Then she sees the, the conventional truth, blue. It's the same analogy here. You see the absence of inherent eye, then you see merely labelled. Merely labelled. Merely labelled. That's what they say. I mean, what else can we do but think about it? Nothing else. So all we can do is say it and think about it until the penny drops. And then we realise it and then we're happy. One step at a time. But the way to think about daily life is really good, so simple. See things from another point of view. That's dependent on rising, you know. That's all the woman did, so she became happy. It's incredible, so simple. But the most hard thing we'll ever do in the universe. Because when we're caught up in bad things happening, look at how, how we are, you know. When things goes wrong, when a person harms us, when bad things happen, look at the sense of the grasping at the poor me. I'm not being mean. Look at us. It's like, a, it's like as big as Mount Everest. This sense of it's not fair. How dare they do that to me? The truth of it is absolute. That's why your example, Chuck, if you really are on the body such a path, it might be the best damn thing for you to take the blame and lose your job. You've got to know what's the best thing. You've got to know how brave you are, how fast you want to get to your goal. You get my point? That's it. Like Harry was prepared to fall off the bloody cliff, you know. It wasn't like he was going, oh, I'm going to test myself now. Look at me, I'm falling off the cliff, look at me. No, no, not like that. You understand? And he couldn't have done that, of course, without years of practice. He's done years of retreat up in his little cave up there somewhere, you know. Up above here somewhere is his cave.
It's up to what we're capable of. So as Lamazopa says, you know, let me let me just read from Lamazopa from his Oh, I haven't got my letters to my prisoners here, I'm so sorry. I don't think I've got it. Maybe I have. We'll see. Yeah, I have I might have it. We'll see. An amazing chapter on attachment as well. Really amazing chapter on detachment. Where's the book? I'll see if I can I mightn't open up here with the damned internet. Let's see. Oh, it could be. Here's the word document. Yep, there it is. Okay. All right. Let's find the chat on emptiness. On the attachment, it's a really good chapter on attachment. This is this is to the prisoner who got a forty-five page letter. He was so kind, unbelievable. For days and days and days. And this is, I mean, he has a, he has a folder of two thousand letters at any given point. Some of my, one of my friends who had cancer, she she got a letter. She got her answer in two years. It was the perfect timing, in fact. One of his students, you know, she got an answer in two years. He's got 2,000 letters at any given time in his folder, you know. And he spent, might spend six weeks on one person. He never gets anxious about it. He does what has to get done, you know. All the chapters in here, so outrageous. I don't think Wisdom wants to publish it because it's too shocking for the world, you know. We like to, as I said to him, this type of teaching, this is Lo Jong personified, but we like to he read it in poetry form from a thousand years ago. We feel safe. But you read a current 21st century telling people in prison to be happy because they've got, they're in a herpetage, the world can't bear that. It's too shocking, you know. So prison is not the real prison. Prison is a concept. Being in prison is an incredible opportunity. The kindness of those who put you in prison. I mean, it's too shocking to read even just the, the chapter heading. <laughs> let's look at the um, let's look at the attachment chapter. It's amazing. There's nothing to be attached to. Okay, chapter nine. Chapter 9, can't find it, 7, 8, 9, here we go. Okay, you mentioned in your letter about the habit of attachment to sex, how difficult it is for you. There is a saying in the teachings, I don't remember the word for word, that if there were a chili plant, if where there is a chili plant growing, you put sweet honey only a few times, it won't make it sweet. Anyway, whatever. So of all the delusions, you have to understand how unbelievably strong the habit of attachment is. The habit of attachment to sex, desiring sex, didn't begin in this life. It is from the past lives. In fact, it didn't have a beginning. It's beginningless. From beginningless rebirths, you've had this mind habituated to attachment to the opposite sex and to sexual pleasure. It arises in the mind due to causes and conditions. An imprint was left on the mental continuum by attachment before, thus planting the seed. Then there's the condition, the object of attachment, the body of the opposite sex, and so forth. Attachment is a causative phenomenon arising from the seed, the imprint of the delusion. Every time attachment arises, it leaves an imprint on the mental continuum, like planting a seed, and that causes attachment to arise again. That leads to the action, and then again, the same problem. That action leaves imprints on the mental continuum. We become more and more familiar with that habit, and then only engage in non-virtue. This habituation makes the future lives so difficult. Future lives not, doesn't mean just one life, but all the coming future lives. Then your suffering of samsara has no end. It becomes endless. Not only the endless lower realm suffering, but the endless sufferings in human rebirths as well. Again and again, you will engage in all those negative actions with attachment. There'll be the no end to going to prison. There'll be no end to the other sentient beings complaining about you and no end to the police and the judge and others having to put you in prison. There'll be no end. Why? Because of the habituated mind of attachment. Analyze the body. There's nothing to be attached to. When we're attached to somebody, we're attached to their body. Of course, it's not necessarily always the body. Sometimes we're attached to the voice, a sing-song voice, let's say, or to their knowledge or intelligence, or sometimes we're attached to their wealth or their personality, smell or sense of humor. As for the body, if you look at the skin under a microscope, you'll see it differently than without a microscope. You'll see many pores, and the skin cells look like mountains. There's no truly existent skin. It's just a collection of cells, atoms. Right now, you see the skin is beautiful, having colors, etc. However, there's nothing there from the side of the object. Not even the slightest atom is there from its own side. How you see the skin is according to your view. It comes from your mind. It is your mind's projection. 
Then if you take off the skin, if the skin is separated from the body and put aside, suddenly there's nothing to be attached to. Without skin, there is no way to be attached to the rest of the body. Without skin, it would be shocking. It would be incredibly shocking. Even when you see blood coming out of somebody's body, you get frightened. There is certainly no attachment to the blood coming from their body. Or let's say the body you are attached to smells of caca, poop. He said in this letter, it was the first time he'd ever used the word poop. It's American, isn't it? They say poop. The same young body, it's the same shape, the same style of hair, the shape of the nose, the cheeks, the lips, everything's the same, but it smells. You wouldn't be attached to it then, would you? These are the logical reasons that prove that there's nothing from the body's side to be attached to. Attachment has a lot to do with the face. You believe there's a truly existent face, not merely labelled by your mind. You have this view from the negative imprints left by past ignorance. This projection exaggerates a beautiful hairstyle, beautiful nose, beautiful cheeks, nice this, that. It's just your interpretation. Your mind makes up beautiful. First you exaggerate and then attachment arises. Then you believe this is beautiful. Not only does your mind label it that, but you believe it. Attachment clings to that view and it's hard to separate from it. That becomes a problem for your mind, a problem that didn't exist before the attachment arose. This helps you get some idea that from the object's side there's nothing to be attached to. There's, then there's attachment to the organ of the opposite sex. That is due to imprints from past lives, the imprint left on the mind by attachment to the opposite sex. Of course, it's not necessarily always the opposite sex. This is just a general explanation. Again, here, there's nothing from its own side at all which attachment is, to which attachment is drawn. Past lives attachment to the opposite sex has left imprints on the mind. This time you're a male with a penis, but in the next life you'll be a woman, let's say, and your karmic view of what you're attached to now is the man's organ. Of course, I'm giving a general explanation. I'm not including lesbians or gays. But once you understand the reasoning, the basics are the same, whether it's heterosexual, gay or lesbian. We need to understand that there's nothing coming from there. It goes on about in another chapter about emptiness. This is the thing about the imprints. And this is our, the imprints. Like we talked about the fishermen, you know. Well, my friend Panos, I always quote this. I used to feel guilty because he didn't, then I asked him for permission. He gave me permission to talk about it. He, he's, he, really, he really likes sex. I think he's, a bit, he's older now and he's calmed down a bit. When he was younger, I mean, he told a story of when he was six, walking down the street of Athens with his, with his Greek Orthodox mummy. And she, he sees a, a, a poster in a cinema. It's like a half-naked lady, you know? So it's like the, the fisherman. The, the karma is ripened. His tendency to like girl shapes is triggered really strongly. And he said, mummy, why is my penis standing up? This little voice piping up, you know, and the lady in the cinema kind of made a joke about how he'd be a lady killer. And his mummy, of course, was, you know, was mortified. So it's the same. He wasn't thinking about any girls, but the imprints in his mind, the memory from past attachment to girl shapes as a rat, as a monkey, you name it. Suddenly he just sees a poster and boom, memory, the memory is triggered. And all his little wind energies start coursing around, triggered by the attachment and his little thing stands up. This is how it works. That's why if it's ridiculous, poor men with their things standing up. I don't know how you cope with one, frankly. I must have had one once. I mean, it's just he's not got a life of its own, you know. I mean, men get, and look at your men running around defining by your silly thing between your legs. And it's got, it really, and just the airs get excited and up it goes, you know. I mean, God, I'm glad ours is secret, us girls. Ours is inside, you see. Anyway, never mind. So, <laughs> but the thing is, when we understand the Buddhist view about the subtle wind energies connected to our mind, and because of karmic imprints, you know, the fisherman just saw the fisherman. He didn't, maybe his thing didn't stand up, but he got very happy. Well, you know, when it's an extreme example, like Panos and girl shapes, it's not, it's not the, the, it's just a symptom. It's that, that thing standing up is simply the symptom of the air energies connected to his attachment being very excited. Like when you're angry, you shout and yell and scream. The air energies trigger the anger and it's just like an explosion inside you, isn't it? That's the same here. So naturally it triggers an immensely good feeling. So of course he wants girl shapes. So he told me how he saved up his pocket money. And when he was 12, the first thing he did was buy a prostitute. He loved going to prostitutes. And he was very interesting. He didn't mind if they were fat and old with their breasts down to their waist. He liked their energy. He didn't care. He liked ladies, you know, he was very funny. He still does, I think, I'm not sure. Pinos, hi. <laughs> so this is the point about karma, the karmic imprint. You understand? The karmic imprint, it was girl shapes. But this is the point about no inherent nature. That, let's say he gets excited about some girl, then she cheats on him, he doesn't like, him, he doesn't like her anymore. This proves it's the mind. The girl, he, he can't stand her now. His eyes see the same girl, but his little thing stays quiet. 
because he now he doesn't like her. He now has got aversion in his mind. That's the proof that it's the mind. The body's just a symptom, you know. And because it gives us pleasure and because it's a habit, we keep craving it. I mean, we're so silly, really. We kind of just dumb to ourselves, aren't we? Fall into our own, our own traps, you know. And this is the one about karma. I mean, these days we're so much more degenerate with, with sexual attachment, you know, we're never satisfied. So we want upside down and back to front. We want to come different genders. We want this way, that way, in the mouth, in the ear. We're never satisfied. Just this constant, un bottomless pit of, of craving. So when it's really gross and we bring our attachment from in the animal realms, the people now, I mean, I read about it in Vanity Fair 25 years ago, they're called furries. A whole, a whole subculture of people, I'm sure they always existed, but now with the internet, it, it grows quickly, who are attached to animal shapes. And I think, you know, if you think about it, they said it's cartoon-like. They all get dressed up in their animal shapes and they go and have, par you know, parties in hotels and there's conferences. So, they, uh, so this got one guy who was mainly interviewed, he spends all his money on eBay, on his, on his monkey suits and his chimp suits and his, you know, his animal suits. And they're usually kind of cute, cartoon-like. So I figured well, that seems to be the karma, is you know, the karma of cartoons the last hundred years. Think about it. If everything stays in our mind, since little children, we're so addicted to you know, all the stories of cartoons, animals and pets and our toys. They're all personified animals. So we're naturally super attached to them. So this sounds ridiculous, but it's logical. So the next life, and it's, not, it's quite benign, you're not hurting them. So next life you're born as a human because you're a nice white Christian person. And they're mostly males, he said, in this article that he knew about. But he's, since a little boy, when he was about six at the sports in America, his little thing stood up when he saw the, the Mickey Mouse mascot. He didn't know why. It's exactly the same thing. He's got a familiarity in his mind with animals. So, and you see, the point is sexual pleasure, which in the Christian teaching we think of as a gift from God, for goodness sake, it's just a very strong pleasure, that's all. It's the same as anything. Attachment is attachment is attachment. It doesn't matter what the object is. The pleasure it triggers is depending on your karma. Well, the fisherman got excited that Robert Hughes, I mentioned the arts writer of the New York Times, who's now dead, the Australian, he had really strong karma to kill fish. He talked about his first experience, like I said, of trout fishing as a cosmic experience, meaning the pleasure was really strong. Well, the, the, the intensity of the pleasure is, is the extent of the intensity of the karmic connection. So sex is clearly a strong one for us. I mean, look at us, we've created the cause to have these two separate people, one called boy, one called girl, one got a long thing, one got a hole, and they meet. What's attachment? Crave, I mean, we create these things. It's like karmic evolution. We create penises and vaginas, but now we're not happy. So we want animals instead. So he said since little boy, he's been this, he now found his people, you know, and they go on their conferences, and he likes having sex with his toys. He pointed out his, his Mickey Mouse thing. He said, so this shows emptiness. He goes to the shop, buys a couple of meters of felt. He turns into an animal, stuffs it in, puts two beads for an eye, and his little thing stands up. This proves emptiness. We created. He tried having sex with, what do you say? Human size appropriate, human appropriate size animals like German shepherds, but he prefers his stuffed toys. He has sex with his stuffed toys, okay? It proves the mind. I mean, there's all these kinds of people now. I remember the whole show I saw on the telly about these men who like, who buy these sil rubber suits, ladies, women, pink, totally dress themselves from head to toe with this pink suit, looking like a doll, looking exactly like a doll. He even puts his own hair on the vagina, he said, it made it very personal. That's how he sees himself. He looks in the mirror, sees this doll, literally a doll. Are we hearing, are we communicating here? So we just think it's normal. Panos was normal. The fairies are weird. This pink doll guy is weird. It's just attachment. It's the same thing. But we're dissatisfied. It's not enough just to have a, a person, have a relationship and have a few babies or something or just have fun. You, we're not satisfied. So we keep creating more fantasies. So karmically we keep creating more things. So we're never satisfied. Never happy. No matter what. So we're just going to keep creating more things and get lower and more gross. Because the more the craving, the grosser we become. This is not against sex. It's not the point. We just become gross more greedy, more hungry, and could create more things. So soon it'll be law, law to have you know, sex with animals. I'm sure it will, the times are degenerate. There's attachment, attachment, the bottomless pit. It can't get what it wants, it's a lie. It's not moralistic, it's practical.
So for, this is another case to consider. For a person who isn't a lesbian or isn't gay, there wouldn't be any attraction to someone of the same sex, would there? But if, let's say, that they become gay or lesbian, now they have a, a view that they didn't have before. Suddenly the mind changes. Well, let's say you're not, you're not attached to a particular person and then after a while they're very kind to you, nice to you, they give you lots of things and then all of a sudden you're attached to them and then the story goes berserk. That's what happens all the time. Always dissatisfied. The main problem with attachment is the dissatisfaction. You're never satisfied with the pleasure you had. So you desire more pleasure or better pleasure. That's why we keep creating these new things, you know. Dolls, animals, robots. Never ends. The mind is never satisfied with the previous sensation. So you want to repeat the act again. Again, you're not satisfied. The pleasure doesn't last. You look for another pleasure, an even better pleasure. There's always expectation, always the pleasure that will be, bring satisfaction. But it never comes. For years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes, you never get satisfaction. By following attachment, even in one billion years, you will never get satisfaction. Even if you owned the whole world, including the sun and the moon and the planets, even if you possessed them all, still you wouldn't get satisfaction. This dissatisfaction is the heaviest suffering, the biggest problem in people's lives in the West. In fact, the more you have, the unhappier you are. There's only suffering inside, no inner peace and happiness. All this comes from the non-virtuous thought of attachment. <coughs> Our mind makes things up, but we, but we believe that what we see has nothing to do with us. It's a total mind creation. Your mind creates the object. There is no beautiful body from its own side. Nothing like that exists from its own side. It came from the negative imprint left by the attachment from the past. It's just the view of your karma. What you attached to is only your own karmic view, only what you thought. You are attached to what your mind labels. You are attached to your own view, but you t believe totally that is that has nothing to do with you, that nothing came from your mind, that it totally came from the object of your attachment. This is a total hallucination. You need to see that there's nothing from the side of the object. There's nothing existing from its own side. It is your own projection coming from your own mind, labeled according to your own karmic view. It is a concept made up by your mind. When attachment arises, beware of it. Be able to recognize what is happening while it is happening, knowing that it is your mind labeling, then believing in it. This is my karmic view. What I'm attached to is my karmic view. This is helpful. Then you are aware of the problems you're creating in your life that you didn't have before. The attachment of object is merely labeled by your mind. It's a concept. It's kind of a shock to discover there's no such thing there to be attached to. This helps to kick the habit. We need to keep the mind immersed in this by meditating on it as much as possible every day. Remember it again and again with respect to the objects of anger as well. Caught up in the habit of attachment, the mind is so uncontrolled. There's no freedom when you are totally overwhelmed by attachment. Your mind has no peace. Meditating in this way, discovering in this way is the method to make your mind free from desire, free from this habit that has continued from beginningless rebirths. This is where we have to be so humble and patient with ourselves, though, you know, because when the habits are so strong, and I'm sure with many of my friends in prison, I know the men think about sex all day because that's what attachment is. It's like, you know, I think about food. So I'm still attached to food, you know. So boys couldn't seduce me. Food can every time. You understand? Because the habit is strong. I mean, I can't imagine having to have, think about sex all day. It would be very exhausting because you've got to go find this object and have to be willing, willing to have it with you. Food just needs to stuff it in your mouth, you know. <laughs> Do you see my point? I mean, sex would be a, a very unfortunate one. I feel sorry for people who have attachment to sex all the time. Because you'd think of it all the time. You have to have fantasies all the time. All the time. All the time. Never stopping. And that's where, like my friend on death row, Mitch, he talks about that fellow, I mentioned him, who thinks about torture all the time. Can you imagine, because of past karma, to have thoughts of torture all the time? And when it's a strong habit, we can see the mind, we don't consciously think it, it is just there running us. That's where we have to be brave and know that they're old habits, but learn not to believe in them. It's painful, but we can't make them go away. That We can't go away like a miracle. We have to learn to be brave, to live with these thoughts, to live with them and not give them power. That's the pa major level of practice. And every time you don't give it power, you're weakening it. And next life or even a few years, I mean, I'm, I'm prepared. I'm 75, practically, 74. 
Food is still in my mind, but you don't pay you don't pay so much attention to it. You just kind of joke about it, you know. You let it be there. You don't go on about it. You don't scream at yourself and get guilty. I'm so attached to food, blah blah. You just shut up and let it, let it you know, just eat your food and shut up. You learn to live with it. You've got to learn to live with your delusions. That's the major level of practice. You're not giving power to them because they're big habits. It's like they're going a thousand miles an hour and it takes a while for the brakes to go on them. It doesn't stop overnight. That's a really important thing about practice. We have to just accept the delusions are there, like your crazy roommates, you know, but you learn to give them less power. It's hard training. But that's what practice is. And then you, then you consciously have the virtuous thoughts and you start giving power to them and they are the ones you become, become familiar with. And so you're, you're changing, you know, you're changing your mind. It takes time. So we've got to be brave and accept the stuff. So there's a big difference. This is where we're a bit scared. We think, oh, I'm an angry person. Oh, my God, I'm so angry. I shouldn't be angry, blah, 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 you know. But there's a big difference between anger being there because it's so habitual and consciously buying into it. There's a very big difference. And when we realize that, we won't be scared of our mind. You know, for example, if I'm mad at Chuck, I'm angry with Chuck. He's hurt me. And I go to my friend and, and I go to Christine and we spend the hour talking about Chuck, how evil he is. That's what's called being angry. But if I'm working on my mind and the anger's raging in me and I go, to, I go to Christine as my friend to help me sort through it, even though I'm weeping with anger, there's a very different discussion because I'm trying to work with it. That's not being angry. You've got to see the difference. Are you seeing my point? Then you have to own it and hear it and, and, and realize how strong it is. But the, the thought is to change it. And that's why I'm not saying I'm a saint. But that experience at Lama Yeshi was so kind at the very beginning, giving me this job to work with this guy. I, I met my anger and my pride and my rage full on, what I never would have done in my life. I would have bought into it and walked away. But he forced me to live with my garbage. I was not comfortable to be around, but I was practicing. Are you seeing what I'm saying, people? I'm trying to say I was a saint. I continue to work there, struggling with it every day. That's called practice. So we've got to know the difference in our mind. I'll be scared of it, you know. And that's why we do purification every day. It's just this marvelous psychology. You own it, you regret it because you're sick of the bloody suffering. You, do, you have compassion, you do the purification, and you vow to make changes step by step. It's very reasonable. It's very intelligent. It's not guilt. It's not neurosis. It's not religion. It's working with your mind. Habits die hard. And these habits are ancient, Buddha says. Ancient. So we have to be courageous. Not be scared of our mind. So this is a chapter on, this is the emptiness one. It's all in the same letter for that man, but I broke them into different chapters. Everything is labeled by the mind. Not only is the object of attachment a concept, the I is also a concept. First of all, there is the I that is merely imputed by the mind because there is the base, the aggregates, the association of body and mind. When the body is kept in prison along with the mind, the mind is dwelling within the body, the mind simply labels, merely imputes, I am in prison. The mind merely imputes that, then believes it. Simply by imputing it, the mind believes, I am in prison. I've been put in prison. In reality, if you analyze, there is no real I there that has gone to prison. In reality, there is no real I that has been put in prison. Nobody can put that I in prison because that I, which appears to us as real and is believed in, in the sense of existing from its own side, doesn't exist at all. That I doesn't exist at all. Nowhere can you find it. Neither the body is the I, nor is the mind the I. If you analyze more, you will find that each of the aggregates is not the I. Even the collection of the aggregates is not the I. The parts, you know. The real I is also found not... The real I... The, that real I also cannot be found in the parts, which is the base. The parts are the basis for the label I. It exists nowhere, neither in the sky, nor in the ground, nowhere. It cannot be found. By logical reasoning, it cannot be found. You can see by scientifically checking that it cannot be found. Scientifically checking means using reasoning. With wisdom, what you realize after analyzing is that scientifically the eye is totally non-existent. It is totally empty. And that is the ultimate nature of the eye, the very nature of the eye, the reality. How does labeling happen? For example, if you ask yourself, what am I doing? You think, I am sitting, or I am talking, or I am meditating, sleeping, eating, whatever. First, the mind sees the parts, the body and mind, and sees what action the parts are doing. The body is doing the action of sitting. The mind is doing the action of meditating. And then according to that activity, the mind makes up that label. 
So then second, right after that, because of the subtle negative imprint of grasping at true existence in our minds, the mind projects, decorates. Even though I am sitting is merely imputed by the mind, the next second, when what the mind has merely imputed appears back to us, it does not appear as merely labelled by the mind, it appears as not merely labelled by the mind, as something real in the sense of existing from its own side. Then we believe it. It is not only that our mind labels it, we believe it. First there appears a real I, a real I that is really sitting, talking, sleeping, meditating. Then the mind imputes, I am sitting. The mind labels, imputes. And then the mind immediately decorates, projects true existence onto the action so that the action appears as real. The mind makes it real in the sense of existing from its own side. In reality, the I is empty. The parts are totally empty. The senses, the objects of the senses, actions, Everything is totally empty. There is no such thing as these phenomena. They don't have true existence at all. They don't have the slightest atom of true existence. All this is projected, false, a total hallucination. All this is totally non-existence. This emptiness of true existence is the ultimate nature of all phenomena. It is like this for all phenomena, the aggregates, the parts in general, each of the individual parts, the senses, the objects of the senses, everything is made real because of the subtle negative imprint of grasping at true existence in our minds. The defilements project all this dual view. Basically, we create our own world. As we discussed before in relation to attachment to a person's body, you believe that it exists from its own side, but that is totally wrong. If the beauty existed from the side of the object, not projected by your mind, that person's body should be seen as beautiful by everybody, by every living being. When you compare different bodies, you will see that one is more beautiful than another, or that one is ugly compared to that one. This makes it very clear that beautiful and ugly come from our mind. They don't come from the object side at all. If ugly and beautiful existed from their own side, every human being should see it like that. Every human being should have the same view. Everybody should have the same appearance, but they do not. They do not. Let's make this point a little bit clearer. When you were a child, before you were taught the alphabet by your school teacher, you saw what was written on the blackboard as a drawing or a design. You didn't see that it was A, this is B, this is C. You didn't see those designs as those letters. At that time, all you saw was a design. Once your teacher introduced you to A, B, C, D, your mind imputed, believed in, bought into, accepted the meaning A, B, C, D. on those designs. Where are we? I lost it. So from then on, from there, from then, from then there was the appearance, now there is the appearance to you of A. Only after that did you see A. Your mind labelled A, then believed in it. Only after that was the appearance of A. So what I said before about the dollars, there was five dollars. You know, Christina knew it was five dollars. She spent it. She knew it was. I didn't see five dollars. I didn't know the meaning. I saw this yucky paper or some whatever I saw. I didn't. So I didn't buy into it. But as soon as I learned it's five dollars, I learned the meaning of it. I labelled it that. And then it became five dollars for me. That's what they're talking about. Of course, there's five dollars there. But until you know it's five dollars for you, there's no five dollars. That's the meaning. So now you can see that the A that you are seeing came from your mind. Your mind imputed A and then you believed in it. It started with that. The whole process started with that. It came from your mind. But when this A appears to you right after the mere imputation by the mind calling it A, it appears as if it's there on those lines. Why is that? That's the big question. Why does it appear there on those lines? Because of the imprint of past ignorance grasping at true existence from the habit of eons of lifetimes, of doing it, that's all. Each line of the design is not A. Even all the lines together are not A, because all the lines together are the base upon which your mind imputes A. If that base, those lines, were already A, then the very first time you saw that design, before you were introduced to A, you would know it is A. But the first time you saw it, you didn't see A. You just saw the lines. Only after you were introduced to it and your mind made up the label A, called it that, only then was there the appearance of A. Then you saw A. That very clearly proves that the whole design is not A. It is the base be, to be labelled A. So Chris's mind, Christi, Christine's mind is the base for the label mind. Christine's mind is a component of Christine. 
to see is the label you, ba you, you impute upon the mind and the body. So the mind isn't the label. The label can't be the base. The base has one thing, the label's another. So yes, th this is labeled by the mind. Without the mind labeling A, A doesn't exist. For me, for you it does. A is labeled by mind. And what is called A is a name. And the name has to come from the mind. The name has to be imputed by the mind. Right from the beginning, what was the cause of seeing A? What caused you to label it A? You have to have seen some design first. Then you labeled A. Before you label father, you have to see those particular parts, that particular shape of body, that face. By recognizing those parts, then next your body labels father. You don't label father before seeing those particular parts, that shape of the body that perform the function of father for you. You don't say, oh, father's coming into the house until you see those parts. First you see that particular body, then you, that connection to you, and then you label father. And only after that do you see father. It is very clear then that you don't see father before seeing the base, the parts. You don't label father before seeing those particular parts, which are the base. Nor do you label father at the same time as you see the base. It all happens so quickly we don't notice this process, you see. That's what we have to learn to see. Unpack it. Believing that it happens at the same time is totally wrong. This is already proved by experience. In order for your mind to label father is coming into the room, you have to first see the parts coming into the room. You see father only after seeing the base, the parts. It's exactly the same with the body of the person you're attached to. You are seeing a body as beautiful. The evolution is exactly the same. Your mind labeled beautiful and then believed in it. If your mind did not label it as beautiful in the first place and then believe in that it is beautiful, there would be no appearance of beauty. You wouldn't see beauty. It is clear with this example. It starts from the mind. It all starts from the mind. Same with the A. First you see the design, then your mind labels A, then you see A. Then you buy into it. And then, as the Lama said, we're like children who draw a lion and then become afraid of it. That's samsara. The base and the label are not separate, but they are different. This is the type of, when you study this stuff in detail, you've got to go into incredible detail about these words, dependent, independent, separate, one, different. You've got to really get clear. It's, it's, the, it's the basis of the analysis you have to do to understand this, you know. It's so precise. You know, this is the thing you see, the precision and clarity that we know we need just to make a cake is the precision and clarity and depth of analysis that this is what this work demands, you know, internal. Therefore, that design is not A. Rather, it is the base upon which we label A. This point is very important. The base is not the label, but the base and the label do not exist separately. They exist too differently. Not separately, but differently. They are different phenomena. It is extremely important to differentiate the label and the base. Seeing the base and the label as indifferentiable, that is the object to, to be refuted. That is the wrong view. That is the false A. That is not the reality. Meditate on that. You can see very clearly that you can't find the A on this base, on those lines. Not one part of the lines is A, nor is one of the lines A. Even the whole group of lines is not A. You can't find A on those lines. If you look for it, you can't find it. This should be very clear. This is the reality. So now, here is the point. You have to really pay attention here. Through this analysis, even though you cannot find A on the lines, it doesn't mean there is no A. There is A existing. Yes, there is A, because there is this design there on the blackboard, because there are these lines. There is A, but it is merely labeled A. It's merely imputed by your mind. You cannot find the merely imputed A on the lines, but A can be found. It can be found on the blackboard, because there is the base, the lines on the blackboard. But an A that is appearing to you on those lines as findable, which has the same meaning as a real A in the sense of existing from its own side, that is completely false. That is the object to be refuted in the philosophical texts. And when we realize that that is totally non-existent, empty as it is empty, then we are realizing the ultimate nature of the A, that which is emptiness.
It is exactly the same with a beautiful body. The beautiful body appears there, as if it is there on the base, the parts, after the mind has imputed it. It appears as a findable, real one, in the sense of existing from its own side, not merely labelled by mind. It even appears as if it never came from your mind, had nothing to do with your mind. That's the extremely gross wrong view that sees it as completely existing from its own side. And this is how we live our lives. That's why we're so hungry and empty and neurotic and insane because life is out there and we're frantic to find it because we feel like we're nothing that's the tragedy of ego grasping and attachment we become this just empty vampire the subtle wrong view is seeing it as appearing as not merely labeled by mind that is the subtle object to be refuted according to the prasangika majjhimika view one of the four schools the majjhimika has two sub schools the svatantrika and the prasangika and it is the prasangika view of the object to be refuted that we're discussing here seeing the beautiful body as not merely labeled by mind is totally wrong totally false if you look you cannot find it there on the base the aggregates that beautiful body not merely labeled by the mind if you look for it you cannot find it there on the base nor anywhere it is exactly the same as the analysis of a so seeing the body is there appearing from above the base is totally false in reality if we analyze we will realize that that is totally non-existent empty right there and that is the realization of the ultimate nature of the body the same for the person for everything now you can see there is no beautiful body existing that is not merely labeled by the mind there is no real person not merely labeled by the mind there's no such thing there it is totally empty mind exaggerates beautiful this and that and then attachment grasps onto it but there is no such thing Lama Tsongkhapa explained in the Lamrim Chenmo by quoting the teachings of 400 stanzas by the great Indian pundit Arya Deva. On the basis of what ignorance holding to existence exaggerates, the mind exaggerates, this is beautiful. Then attachment arises on that. This also applies to anger. On the basis of the person and so forth, appearing not merely imputed by mind, then the mind exaggerates, bad, ugly then anger arises towards it. In reality, there is no such thing. There is no such object of anger. In reality, it is a total hallucination, false. There is no such thing. On the basis of what ignorance holding to existence exaggerates, this means grasping at the person's body, for example, as truly existence, then mind exaggerates, this is ugly, undesirable, then anger arises on that. You can clearly see the conclusion from this quotation. What ignorance grasping as truly existent exaggerates is totally non-existent. The object of anger or attachment that you totally believe in is, is there is totally non-existent. This is an extremely important meditation to realize. By realizing this, you are able to eliminate the ignorance grasping at true existence and the rest of the delusions based on this ignorance. This is how we, the sentient beings, can be liberated from the oceans of samsaric suffering and its causes. Meditate every day on all these points. The many different examples I described including the examples about attachment, especially the analysis of what is reality and what is false, and especially the quotation from Arya Deva. And of course, including, as we discussed at the very beginning of this other chapter, oh, it's editing. Now you can see very clearly that the real I, in the sense of existing from its own side, that which appears and is believed as existing from its own side, that I is not in prison. You can't find that it in prison, and nor can you find it on the, on the parts, the base. You must do this meditation every day. This is important, no matter how many hours it takes. There's no question that ignorance and attachment can be removed from the mind because they're dependent arisings. If they were independent, they could not be removed. But because they are dependent, they can be removed by other causes and conditions. In fact, all the defilements can be ceased. Because these seeds are not permanent phenomena, they are causative phenomena, they can be removed by the remedy, by the path, by the analysis, the logic. <coughs> And finally, we can, be, we can be liberated totally from all the delusions because we have Buddha nature. Every insect, every worm, every spider, as well as the beings in all the realms of existence, all have mind, and all their minds have Buddha nature. The emptiness of their mind is their Buddha nature. There is no mind existing from its own side, even though it appears that way to us, and due to ignorance, we believe it. That's why everyone can be free from the suffering of samsara. Everyone can achieve Buddhahood, the total cessation of obscurations, and the completion of the realizations. This is the meaning of the word Buddha.
Even the subtle negative imprint that projects the subtle dual view can be removed completely by the wisdom directly perceiving emptiness with the support of bodhicitta by completing all the merits of wisdom and merits and merit that wis of merits and wisdoms of virtue then your mind becomes a fully enlightened mind true cessation can be achieved because there is the true path lord buddha has revealed and explained the true path in the teachings and there are many great masters in whose minds the path exists as experience from whom we can learn we can learn from them and practice so this is how we can cease the, the delusions and be liberated from ever, forever from all suffering and its causes. Time for tea.